Hello, everyone. Good to see you. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are uh, from around the world. Uh, I'm John Ernie from Hong Kong. So uh, we are starting our sixth panel uh, discussion uh, for this conference. The theme is me and we. This is the second me and we panel of this conference. And the particular focus on this panel is reimagining community and social bonds from now and into the future. So we are very, very uh, pleased to have four uh, very esteemed speakers and friends, really some very old friends uh, as well to join this panel. I'm going to introduce the moderator or the convener of this, uh, of this panel, who's also a speaker. And then uh, he'll introduce the other speakers from Scotland and Ireland and Japan. So the convener is Professor Ron Burnett. Uh, Ron, Professor Ron Burnett is the President Emeritus of Emily Carr University of Art and Design. He's also currently the research director for the Center for Transdisciplinary Studies at Emily Carr. He is a recipient of the Order of Canada, the Order of British Columbia, and he was appointed a Chevalier de l'Ordre des Arts et des Lettres by the French government in 2010. He has published many, many things and is the former editor and founder of the CNA Track magazine. So let me pass it on to you, uh, Professor Burnett. Thank you very much and welcome to everyone. Um, I'd like to express my thanks uh, to uh, John Ernie and Meta Hjort for their extraordinary organization and the work they've done to make this conference happen. I wanna welcome our panelists and I wanna welcome our viewers everywhere. So I, as uh, John said, I, I was the president of Emily Carr University of Art and Design and that went on for 22 years. So I'm really uh, quite uh, involved in the art and design world and coming out of a cultural studies background and communications background as well. Uh, I wanted to also thank Hong Kong Baptist University and thank uh, everyone else for attending and thank the panelists for putting together what I'm sure will be a terrific uh, session. Our session is entitled Me and We, Reimagining Community and Social Bonds Now and in the Future. Each speaker will have 20 minutes for their presentations. And each speaker will also uh, add to the introduction that I'll make of them so that we have a fully fledged understanding of their backgrounds. We will discuss the presentations as a panel for 20 minutes at the end. And then there will be time for questions from the audience after the discussion which should be submitted by the question Q&A on your uh, Zoom screen if you're coming in on Zoom. The session will end at 3.50 Hong Kong time, uh, which will be close to one o'clock Vancouver time and uh, be the early morning in Scotland and Ireland. Uh, and I don't know what time it will be in Japan at that point. So I'd like to start uh, our session with uh, Professor Rod Stoneman, who is the director of the Houston School of Film and Digital Media at the National University of Ireland in very, very beautiful Galway. And Rod will be followed by Professor Dina Ayadinova, who is a Professor Emeritus of Global Cinema and Creative Cultures uh, at the University of St. Andrews, Scotland. And then Professor Koichi Iwabushi, Professor of Sociology at Kwansei Gakuen University in Japan. So welcome all and thank you for attending and over to you, Rod. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Ron. Um, uh, I, uh, I should actually make a m minor amendment in that um, I cease to be a full-time academic um, running the Houston Film School uh, about five years ago. So um, I, I have the strange Latin emeritus um, uh, epithet in front of a professor as well. I should be um, clear about my institutional status, but let me begin by thanking um, not only John and Mete, but also Christina and Edmund, who um, brought me into the um, um, strange world of Zoom um, uh, earlier in the week. Um, it, as you can probably see from the window behind, which is uh, emanating blue light, uh, it is very early in the morning here, about um, uh, just after 7 a.m., which reminds me of uh, Oscar Wilde's great uh, uh, line, only dull people are brilliant at breakfast. So um, sailing under um, Oscar Wilde, um, I'll uh, give it a go. I'm going to try and trace some routes through the pandemonium of the present. Uh, and indeed that includes making use of some material by um, uh, 
my eldest two sons, uh, Adam, who wrote an article, and Otto, who did some drawings. Um, somehow, it seems, uh, referencing one's own family in a talk like this, um, it connects with the much closer uh, social sphere, the interactions of the uh, last six months. Um, and also, maybe it's a minor transgression of um, the uh, normal formulae of academic uh, and scholarly discourse. Um, and I think um, talking actually uh, uh, about uh, the personal, um, I've got a PowerPoint to come, but I'll, I'll show you that this is, uh, most of my thoughts are not as a result of sitting in a library or watching a lot on the internet, but um, it's backwards for me, but I hope you can see this is a little school exercise book, um, which uh, contains uh, a lot of, um, uh, I'm not going to, uh, uh, enforce my, um, uh, uh, you know, watercolors on you, but um, there's a, a, a lot of um, a, a lot of notes over the last six months, which is uh, what I've drawn upon for a few of the ideas here. Um, I uh, also, if I can do it, um, will take you to this PowerPoint, um, which is there. Yes, I hope. I hope, um, and. Um, There we are, that's a full um, PowerPoint. And um, I, I could hardly give a talk without a quotation. Uh, I don't know about Oscar Wilde, but certainly there has to be a Goddard quotation, um, who I had the great honor of working for when I was um, employed by Channel 4. Um, and Goddard, it's necessary to be permeable to the world's upheavals, as it is in the tension between the two poles of the autobiographical and the documentary that poetry's generated. I'm, I'm not sure about poetry this morning, but um, certainly those dynamics, um, uh, in a way it's me and we, but um, of the subjective and the social is what I'm trying to navigate between. And three uh, um, sort of sections from some touching on some new forms of cultural uh, experience um, during uh, the pandemic. Um, moving through to its effect on, on, on social and individual identity and um, trying to finish by, um, actually I can't count, one, two, three, imagining community um, in a post-pandemic situation. Um, actually, one last thing there, I've always been interested in the paradox, uh, all generalizations are false. Um, I'd love to generalize that the pandemic has strengthened me and um, diminished we, or even vice versa. The pandemic has strengthened we and diminished me, but my sense is that it's actually done both in quite complex ways. So this is a rather more tentative uh, uh, stab at it than I'd like, but at least it means the space is open for, for the contention and indeed some aspects may come up in our discussion at the end. Um, uh, the, in terms of the starting point, it's important to say that we live in an image system where um, we are, to use uh, uh, Ron Burnett's phrase, bathed in images. Um, I heard an advertising agency selling space by talking about the 3,000 images a day. It's um, um, suggested uh, we, we, we see uh, each day, though that may be much too low, given that now we watch mostly moving images. Um, and there have, of course, been some changes in the time of the pandemic. Uh, maybe one can, can even say it, in the French term, it's something of a coupure, a break, a breach, a moment of difference or distance from the before and possibly the after. Time itself has been made strange. There's an unprecedented level of the uncertain and the unexpected, more than we've ever been used to. I mean, I guess most of us actually like occasional surprises, but they take place within the frame of um, something stable and something predictable. Um, the pandemic conditions, uh, conditions are entirely other. We're not sure whether we're um, a, you know, continuing for five more weeks or five more months, or even I heard a few days ago uh, from a doctor, five more years. The indefinite uncertainty, actually Shrikant uh, Savaji talked of the new indeterminacy, which is a very succinct way of putting it. Um, and this brings some things into focus, including 
um, the relationship of the individual and the social the relationships we have with each other, the we and the me, um, and the different forms of me specifically. I'll touch on that more later. I think that the pandemic has, for most people, uh, implicitly or ex explicitly made us think about the existential frame, uh, mortality, our lives, and the meanings of that frame. Um, and uh, Brecht's uh, line in 1948, bourgeois society with its anarchic system of production only becomes aware of its own laws of motion through a catastrophe. But mere misfortune is a bad teacher. And in a, a, a good dialectical mode, I think he's pointing out um, uh, the, exactly the oscillation um, I started with um, when talking about um, generalization. And to invoke an earlier commentator on plagues, um, there's a quote from Daniel Defoe's Journal of the Plague Year. Um, these things serve to show how far people were really overcome with delusions, which seemed appropriate to put with an image of a Trumpian anti-mask wearer. Um, in fact, yesterday I watched some of the presentations in my time zone, and um, uh, Dan Zahavi uh, said uh, or showed an image of a, a Trumpian um, with a placard saying, God doesn't want us to wear masks. Well, actually, um, should I meet the protester? I would say, look, the really bad news is that God doesn't care, which is probably where um, um, their insecurities are coming from, amongst others. Um, so uh, relationships uh, have pulled apart and have pulled together in different ways as new communities emerge in digital and in analog forms. I'll talk more about the analog. There is a quick reference to the Italians doing uh, um, a thing they do very well, which is singing from their balconies. Uh, and here is actually a poster about a mile and a half down the road in our village in Ballandarine. I'm, I'm about 10 miles south of Galway on the west coast of Ireland. And there, um, apart from, I mean, Mary and Brendan and Kieran and Catherine might well uh, put phone numbers up for contact anyway, but the context of a poster uh, which uh, states self-isolation doesn't mean you're alone and uses the words um, charity, kindness, contribution, inclusion, awareness, um, as things we should uh, connect with and share is quite extraordinary and um, a we being established um, in a, 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 a very new way. Um, I think that uh, apart from those little references to some of the different variations of community, I think it would be good to look at a couple of examples. So um, if I can do it, uh, first of all, um, I'm going to uh, show a uh, 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 thing from um, the internet, um, uh, a website, um, if I can um, get out. It's called um, Closer to Van Eyck, the um, 15th century um, painter um, who... Uh, I, I'm going to look quickly at one painting. This painting um, I saw, it's called Virgin at the Fountain, and I saw in uh, a museum in Vienna, actually, just a month before the lockdown. Um, and it's very small, actually, 19 uh, centimeters tall and 12 centimeters wide. And here through um, the new website that the Belgians have put up, um, you can look at it in X-ray and move, as the website title suggests, closer to Van Eyck. Well, um, that image there is, uh, you know, perhaps um, five or six times larger than the artist would themselves, uh, that Van Eyck would have um, brought his brush uh, to. So it's a quite extraordinary um, cultural experience, uh, I would say, that has become possible through uh, uh, digital means recently and access perhaps um, passed between people in my experience um, in the internet. I'd like also to show, um, I, I hope that came up as a shared screen, it should have, a little bit of this uh, Steel Antico, a British ensemble um, singing uh, Thomas Tallis's uh, Speminalium uh, with a visual construction uh, 
which uh, reveals the structure of the 40-part antiphon, actually. Um, the original Speminalium oh. uh, 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 is actually... Out of, Ron, uh, sorry to interrupt you, but my screen is showing your original community poster and the other ones are on the side, so you're out of place. Okay. Okay, thank you for interrupting me. I will, uh, it says my um, screen is uh, resume share. It seems to pause itself. Okay. Um, and thank you. Um, do you now have a picture of people in the sky? No. No. No, I don't. Um, okay, I'd like to new share. Uh, I'd like to do that. Okay. And um, yes. I, no, do you have that? Yes. Good, fine. Um, and I want to make sure that um, I'm actually going to get you the sound as well, uh, which I'll try. Anyway, I'll give it a go. Um, thank you. Did you hear it? Yes. You can hear it? Vaguely, vaguely. Not anymore. Well, I better um, return to um, um, the talk because time is running on, but you could glimpse there maybe um, you know, it's worth uh, taking time to um, look at uh, that, um, but it's uh, something which um, um, shows the structure of the music through its visual composition. Whilst after four, it's called 40 parts for 40 days, um, after the uh, uh, lockdown, um, uh, there was, uh, uh, you know, it, it, it was put up and um, shared as a piece of cultural solace, I think would be the word from John and um, Mate's original um, talk. Um, and um, I hope you've uh, got back to the PowerPoint now. Yeah. Yeah, good. No, you're not on the PowerPoint. Um, um, hold I'm on. We're seeing, we're seeing Van Eyck. Yeah, okay, that's good. Um, and in order to come uh, back a little from high, high culture, um, there's an example of the meme proliferation that ha ha has happened. These are pan-Arabist memes, but um, we've all seen hundreds of memes being generated in relation to um, the, the uh, lockdown, I think. Um, I wanted just to say uh, also there are bad things that happened just locally an Extinction Rebellion group was being set up and there was the intrusion of child pornography and a local priest was giving a Sunday morning homily online and uh, I saw because he had not switched off the um, comments uh, there was the intrusion of a pornography hardcore website. Um, on the comment line. So these are um, aggressive, uninvited uses of the anonymity of the internet, um, inarticulate attacks of anger and rage. I mean, it's a whole other paper to start thinking um, why and, and how that happens. Um, but moving on to the, the we and the me a bit more, atomization and connection, I wanted to call it. Um, we're very familiar with the um, s views of those that support a market society which uh, deny the we and assert the, the, the me as the basis for consumer culture. Um, I, uh, I think you've seen Thatcher and Milton Friedman's um, um, quotes before. Um, I wanted to show you a very individual thing I came across yesterday, which is a bar of soap from um, Jordan, actually. I was doing a workshop in Amman, and there's a bar of soap. And you'll notice that, I mean, <laughs> neoliberalism in the brand line, love yourself first. That's actually part of a whole apparatus of uh, ideology that um, we live within. Um, 
I mean, actually, the pandemic's given a different role to the state, but I'm not sure um, that its decisive uh, uh, and quick move to a command state in various areas has been perceived by people as the possibility of a different relationship between the state and the individual. Um, I think that uh, the arts that I, I've uh, uh, perhaps um, you know, indicated through Steel Antico, which I hope you heard in the end, and um, Van Eyck, uh, you know, have been experienced in a much more isolated way. Um, and that um, uh, there's a sense in which um, the fragments of social media, email, TikTok and WhatsApp and Facebook, um, uh, are part of an individualized experience of the social and an erosion of the we. Um, uh, there's an article written by my eldest son, Adam, about the parameters of um, the arts in the time of the virus and the way that um, many good things have happened, but also the economy of the arts has been eroded um, by performers um, unable to uh, practice uh, or be paid for, for their practice. It also talks about copyright um, and a number of um, um, issues around that. Um, here are some drawings done in Bristol College of Art by uh, my middle son Otto. And I think um, they point towards the way in which an individual trying to practice in the arts um, finds themselves in a vulnerable position of exacerbated competitive individualism uh, to be a successful, I mean, maybe not an orchestral player, but to be a writer or a painter or a solo musician, you are alone. Um, I'm just moving on quickly because I've only got three minutes to go. Um, and I, I just wanted to, to, to actually indicate the way the arts can act as glue, especially in an analog sense. This was a, a jar, uh, a jar of poetry, in fact, hanging outside the Houston School of Film um, on the campus at the University of Galway. Um, there, if you get closer to it, you can see the little fragments of paper inside. Uh, a colleague of mine uh, used digital means to draw attention to the analog experience of poetry in the jar. Um, and this is what the jar contains, or some of the bits, a bit of Irish language poetry. Uh, a note of someone who we just parked the car and spotted the jar, a bit of doggerel, um, a drawing. Um, and I, I guess just to uh, connect that, this is a, 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 the jar was outside the university in the town of Galway, but um, this is a, a tree with votive elements on it, a couple of miles in the burren near here, which people have tied um, elements of clothing to because it's next to a holy well. So these analog experiences are the functioning of the arts uh, uh, as glue and working um, to connect uh, uh, people um, with direct experience. Benjamin was mostly right in his 1936 essay, but I think the aura is a more powerful experience in the epoch of mechanical reproduction. Um, I was going to talk about the fragmentation of me, I mean a psychoanalytical notion of the uh, individual subject would suggest that it is not a stable or unified um, entity, that me is actually a series of contending elements, um, and I used a 16-19 picture to do that. Um, uh, I'll, I'll skim past the set of identities that are often pulled um, into place uh, uh, for us. Obviously, the, the, the fourth one out, nation or country, is um, uh, generally the most powerful, very relevant to discussions um, going on in Hong Kong at the moment. Um, and I guess that um, the uh, virulent populist versions um, uh, of right-wing politics appearing during uh, the uh, virus um, is drawing on those. They and them is of course used to make me uh, 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 and we. I'll just end by um, saying during the vicissitudes of the virus, um, one can think of things um, pretty much being returned to the, the, the situation beforehand, and there are many forces working hard to ensure that. Um, on the other hand, one could, together with the Argentinian filmmaker Fernando Biri, still invoke 
the notion of a utopian future with the thought that we may even move half a centimetre uh, uh, towards it. And uh, as I'll finish by following Ian Eng yesterday, who um, she from Sydney also mentioned um, uh, uh, Gramsci and um, I think trying to navigate the morbid symptoms when the old is dying and the new cannot be born is still necessary to create a, a better world against long odds as usual. And the rather overused Gramscian line, I'm a pessimist because of intelligence, but an optimism because of will. And this last image was taken on the penultimate day of Occupy New York, the day before the police moved in and smashed it up. But um, that was in the library of Occupy New York. Thank you very much. I'm just about within time and I'm going to pass to uh, Dina, um, who uh, uh, um, will follow me. Thank you very much. Dina, do you want to start? Dina over. thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ron, and uh, my presentation will just come into the footsteps of yours as I will continue with the PowerPoint presentation using abundance of images. Working with the visual, I couldn't be without images. Uh, and I'll be presenting my personal view. Uh, I wanted to say that I'm speaking from Grail. It is early morning here. The picture you see on my background is uh, from a, a field very near my home. It's a picture perfect village uh, on the uh, seaside in Gulf country, Scotland. Uh, I have not been any, to any personal duress during this time. Uh, and uh, at the moment, I wanted to say also that I'm in quarantine. Uh, so I have been in lockdown for about six months, uh, but I couldn't stand it. And last week I traveled to mainland Europe, not two weeks ago now. Uh, so speaking from home in quarantine, I must also say uh, in line with things which were mentioned in the previous panel that uh, nobody seems to impose any quarantine here. So formally, I'm conscientious and sitting at home and not exposing anybody uh, to myself, but uh, uh, there have been no check, uh, uh, there have been no phone calls, uh, absolutely no follow up, nobody was interested to see the form that I filled out and so on. So the issue uh, here is uh, uh, there are measures, uh, uh, but at the same time, uh, there doesn't seem to be, um, uh, to be interest in enforcing very much. Uh, so I'd like to start my presentation uh, by sharing my screen uh, and uh, I hope uh, I hope that you signal if there is any uh, issue with the presentation which I've entitled the view from my window. Uh, so for me it started with this image which I'm displaying uh, which I received on the 28th of March uh, this year, sitting at home, uh, we had gone into quarantine on the 23rd of March, not quarantine lockdown, sorry. Uh, and on the 28th of March, my friend Margarita from Athens, Greece, sent this image, uh, which was uh, also coming along with an invitation to join a group uh, on Facebook, uh, which was called uh, the view from my window. I have been to her home in Athens. Uh, uh, I know that this is the view from her apartment and I really like the image. It gathered about 75 likes on that day. I did join the group uh, and here I'm displaying for you uh, the description of what, uh, what the invitation on that day was and this is still the same invitation. Uh, the group was, uh, had about probably 70 members and uh, um, was invi inviting everybody to take a picture of, of what they see through their window so that we, they can be shared and uh, that we can be uh, together alone, or uh, together in our aloneness. Uh, and uh, it would be probably a bonding uh, thing. It, was, uh, it had been started by a woman in uh, Belgium, Flemish woman in Belgium as far as I know. Uh, and of course, uh, it was soliciting the, uh, the collaboration of volunteers. Uh, at this same time, around the end of March, uh, government members in Britain appeared on television to explain how they are preparing for the arrival of the virus. 
uh, promising that they will do the right thing at the right time and boasting of a world-beating approach. Britain's Prime Minister and, and uh, the Prince of Wales uh, were still shaking hands with people left and right. And a number of medics and scientists uh, uh, interviewed in the media on the matter of masks uh, uh, were recorded saying that there was no scientific evidence for the usefulness of those. Some days later, this image was posted on the group. Uh, this was the view from the window of the woman who had started the group uh, in her home in Antwerp, I believe. Uh, this is what she was seeing through the window and she was uh, showing her working place where she was receiving images from all over the world and posting them. Less than two weeks into the existence of the group, and this is her post what I'm displaying, uh, it was less than two weeks into the existence of the group, uh, and uh, at that time there were already more than 100,000 members uh, from all over, all over the world. Uh, and uh, she spoke uh, about uh, nearly 4,000 photographs which were in backlog and not yet posted, waiting to be posted. People wanted to share. They were eager to talk to one another in the comments. In Britain at the same time, it transpired that uh, there were severe shortages of personal protective equipment for medics on the front line. It did not take long until we got the first reports of hospital nurses and doctors dying uh, and predominantly people from ethnic minorities. The number of infections uh, and reported deaths was rising exponen exponentially. The convener of uh, the view from my window was working hard day and night to to help people share their images. The photos were becoming more and more refined and gorgeous by the day. It was the picture perfect turn. From Finland to Florida, from Nepal to Nicaragua, people were sending in images that looked so great that one wondered, isn't it actually better for everybody to stay at the gorgeous homes they were showcasing? like this fantastic village in Italy, which attracted 3, 000, uh, over 3,000 likes, or this beautiful morning view at a farm in South Africa in early morning, attracting 23,000 views. Most of the images posted uh, after a certain point were attracting uh, uh, more than 20,000 likes. The pandemics was raging internationally. Whilst my village in Scotland looked equally picture perfect, the daily statistics reported of a deep, deepening crisis. Massive negligence within the public health system led to a disproportionate number of deaths. Into the thousand deaths, especially amidst the elderly living in care homes. People kept sending their images to the group. There was something like a tourist turn now, uh, displaying images of gorgeously enticing travel destinations, like this view from my window, which was of a palazzo in uh, Sicily, or this one, which is a view uh, in Oregon, Flores, Oregon, uh, beautiful Oregon coast. These images were uh, showing uh, fantastic, uh, fantastically attractive places. Uh, eh, well, some are lucky. Actually, judging by the images posted, uh, one was left with the impression that we are all lucky. As most of the images uh, uh, that would show a gloomy day or a neglected backyard simply did not appear in the group. I do not know if no such images were submitted. One thing was clear. People around the world had damn good views from their windows. The pandemic was raging in the United States now. Uh, so there were some uh, images uh, that could be regarded uh, as uh, what I call the COVID-19 turn. I'm sorry. I'm sorry, I'll go back to, to this one. The pandemic was raging in the United States now. The New York Times marked the green milestone of 100 deaths by printing the name of each and every victim whilst the American president was taking 
was talking of infecting, injecting disinfectant to oneself. Closer to home in nearby Glasgow, the city of uh, film director Ken Loach, refugees were, were treated so inhumanely that one of them committed suicide while another one went on a deadly rampage in rage and killed people. Some weeks later, the dead body of a Ugandan refugee mother in her 30s was discovered near the malnourished uh, uh, baby uh, of one year old. Apparently, she had passed from starvation. In the battle of narratives, some members uh, tried to, very timidly, to impose an aesthetic in the group that I called the COVID-19 turn. Only it was not a turn. More it was like the occasional reminder that there is more beyond the abundance of picture-perfect images of dream destinations. Teresa Sanchez, a Latina nurse from Texas who had come to New York City to help out Manhattan hospitals, posted the image uh, I'm showing here of a blind wall that she was seeing uh, when returning briefly to her anonymous hotel room uh, after the shifts. And Barbara from Alabama posted this image of a hospital window on a rainy day to share the news of her mother's death. The mother had just passed in the room earlier uh, on this same day. Uh, and so it went on. It has been six months now. So here I'd like to pause uh, and go away from the group and take stock uh, uh, a little bit, asking uh, where are we and where is me? Uh, more than 40,000 people have died in Britain alone by this uh, uh, point. I personally do not know anyone who died. Thus, it is an imagined community. And the question, of course, is, uh, can we relate to such thing? Uh, um, I relate to it quite intensely. The view from my window currently has more than 2 million members. 64 of my friends, uh, even somebody attending at the moment, from 25 countries are members. Uh, the group has helped a new community to come into existence and bond in an interesting way. And it has catered to our neglected aesthetic needs, something which I believe was very important. I personally lived in isolation and with minimal human contact. I lived through some personal milestones. Uh, I celebrated my 60th birthday in lockdown. Uh, I decided and went through with uh, my early retirement. Uh, and uh, just last week, I celebrated 30 years living in emigration, which marks uh, uh, two uh, distinct parts in my life. Yet, it all felt like happening to someone else in a vacuum. My personal world these days uh, consists of talking heads. A view that looks monotonously off-putting, and I admit I'm tired. This image which I'm showing here is uh, from last week. I, this week I have three conferences. This is from the conference called Contours of Film Festivals at Birkbeck College London. This is another image, now we are at the glamorous uh, Venice Film Festival. So this is what my professional life consists of. The most glamorous film festivals, the most convivial conference discussion, the most illuminating teaching experience, it all looks the same. Our social interactions are reduced to staring at or talking to a screen, as I'm doing now, wherever we are on earth. We are trying hard, but I must admit that behind these online encounters, there is no new bonding, nor friendships appearing, no genuine interaction, no emotional cues, and worst of all, no real discussion. The effort is genuine, yet the result is neither intellectually nor emotionally satisfying. My real stimulation only comes from the here and now. All I have is the view from my window. And as, as I understand, 
listening to people, talking about the future um, about film festivals, the future of education and so on, I hear there is no way back. That even after COVID, the spheres where I would normally move, those of film festivals, those of teaching, those of conference, will still now be hybrid from now on. For me, it comes down to making a choice between the view of the computer screen or the view from my window. So I also submitted a photograph to the group. Here it is. Um, I recognize it is quite plain compared to the other images that uh, I was showing. Uh, my image was never posted to the view from my window. It is probably in the backlog uh, and its turn may come uh, after all these other picture perfect or emotionally shattering images are posted, we don't know. The image was taken on the 21st of April 2020. On earlier days, it is from, the, uh, from my bedroom window and uh, shows the field behind my house and part of the backyard. On earlier days, I had seen local farmers working in the fields behind the house. They plowed on one day and then apparently they sowed. And now in April, the first green shots uh, were springing up. Looking at this image, I realized that for the past 16 years living here, I had never met the farmers and I had not spoken to them in a single, a single time. I had not spoken to my fellow villagers, generally speaking. The COVID-19 crisis subsided, uh, but now it is back with the second wave. It has been seriously mismanaged in Brexit Britain. What is in the store looks equally grim. Looking around the world, the picture is scary. The world is slipping into a new Cold War. There are severe restrictions on freedom of thought, freedom of speech, freedom of travel, and these will stay also after COVID. The world is uh, at its worst on matters of the environment, racial equality, or refugees. In the past months, I have lived through frustration, disbelief, disillusionment, disappointment, sadness, anger, outrage, all an emotional abyss spiraling downwards, which I hope uh, many of you are familiar with and probably managed to overcome. It is only the view from my window that keeps me afloat. Later on, one day in summer, I came to the field behind the house to look at the wheat that I could see through my window. And here it was. Thank you. Thank you, Dina. That was fascinating. I really appreciate the effort that you put into it. Um, I'd like to turn this over to Professor uh, Ko Koichi Iwabuchi from uh, Japan. Uh, Koichi, are you ready to go? You'll have okay, to run. Yeah, I'm ready. Okay. Yeah. Uh, Okay, uh, first of all, yeah, uh, thank you for inviting me to this very fascinating symposium, uh, Mette and uh, John in particular. Uh, actually, uh, to be honest, uh, when I got the uh, invitation, I had no idea <laughs> what to talk about, how to consider the, this pandemic crisis and culturally. It's so, uh, not an easy question for me because you know, uh, we, we can't do any research on the street at the moment. We can do any interview, talk to other person, uh, you know, uh, unless uh, we don't use uh, this kind of Zoom or technology. And so, uh, and also we've been quite busy teaching online. <laughs> and so, uh, 
Yeah, but uh, I think this is a good, great opportunity uh, for me to think something about seriously of a cultural uh, aspect of uh, this uh, COVID-19 uh, crisis. Um, so uh, today's uh, talk is, uh, is kind of very much optimistic uh, one and also very speculative uh, without giving any solid uh, of course, evidence or some kind of uh, 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 rational, uh, rational thinking. But uh, uh, I think uh, uh, yesterday, uh, Ian uh, uh, referred to the uh, Gramsci's, uh, as Roth said, uh, notion of the organic crisis. So the old are uh, dying, but uh, the new cannot yet be imagined. So in this kind of a very uncertain time, and also uh, quite everything is fluctuating at the moment. So it's hard to say something definite at this moment. So, but I think uh, it's quite important for us to say something about future, uh, about the present as well. So, so my talk is uh, something about that. So let me, uh, okay, share my, uh, PowerPoint as well. Um, so uh, I purposely choose the yes, uh, this uh, PowerPoint theme as a quite very optimistic, very uh, kind of a green spring kind of a, uh, something new is imagine images. So. Uh, okay, so uh, of course, uh, I don't need to repeat that there are many kind of areas, issues uh, about the COVID-19 impact. Uh, of course, environmental, ecological, political, international relationship, or screen, digital, a particular screen new deal, what uh, Naomi Klein uh, uh, discussed. And also social life, uh, as, as the previous speakers also mentioned about the use of the media, social media, telework, uh, and the zooming intimacy, uh, et cetera. Uh, so, but uh, for me, uh, this session was uh, me and we, and the social bonding communities. Uh, I'm quite interested in the more nationalism and also racism issue, of course, from the self as me and we. So, uh, yeah, I uh, uh, try to search uh, what kind of discussion going on. Uh, so yeah, many people discuss, as you know, stay at home nationalism, or uh, we are doing better biopolitical nationalism, or vaccine nationalism, as uh, many people already mentioned. And those anti-Asian or Chinese racism, or, or xenophobic quite localism. Uh, so uh, they are everywhere, again, not national, more localized kind of xenophobia uh, is also occurring. And also mass populism, uh, et cetera. But, uh, so that's why so many people uh, try to emphasize the uh, importance of a uh, more interconnection, interdependence or mutual support, including uh, Jack Attali, uh, who uh, refer, used the term of uh, altruism. As, this is one of the most famous maybe phrase. Uh, so uh, yes, uh, it is, I think I agree with him. So to act in support for, of uh, one another is a very important kind of a, a predisposition at the moment. Uh, uh, we need cult base. Um, but at the same time, it's quite interesting. Uh, not uh, many uh, researchers or observers also say oh, something going on uh, about a kind of a, a new kind of a cosmopolitanism. Uh, Ian Rand's talk was a little bit uh, pessimistic about <laughs> this kind of issue. <laughs> Uh, I'm quite more optimistic on a very micro uh, level, not micro issues. So I think uh, I agree with uh, uh, Krastev, who said, yes, so kind of in the, under the, this kind of a process of a deglobalization trend, uh, actually people are getting more uh, interconnected and the people are getting more realized about uh, this kind of interconnection. Uh, I think this is a very interesting, uh, I think, uh, uh, development uh, at the moment. So, uh, for example, uh, uh, including myself, uh, 
no small number of observer witness a uh, renewed sense of a cosmopolitan interconnectedness. So, which means, yeah, so people are getting more conscious about, uh, of course, inequality, widening gap, structural racism, and the discrimination in many parts of the world are in this, uh, under this crisis. And uh, people have a more emp empathy for essential workers and also deprived people who struggle to live uh, under this situation. And also people tend to foster more mutual care for human dignity. And also there are many social movements against social injustice, uh, including BLM, which I, I will focus later. And also uh, in social injustice against Amazon or such kind of big corporation as well. So, so many interesting uh, things are uh, on the rise as well. And so, so question is, uh, so, so this pandemic crisis is uh, giving us opportunity to appreciate what is really essential for our lives and also contemplate if the world can be more caring and egalitarian. And also, uh, uh, are we uh, having a new wave of a connective solidarity, which engenders a new imagination and action to change the world? So I think uh, uh, my talk is not just, uh, you know, I I'm not uh, able, I'm not able to you know, respond uh, properly to these uh, two answers, uh, two questions. But uh, I'm uh, looking at uh, uh, how people try to understand the current situation and, uh, and uh, also make an action under this situation. And then uh, uh, I will introduce some kind of uh, uh, ideas, observation, and uh, their action, and uh, their says uh, about focusing on the BLM in, in the world and also particularly in Japan. And then back to the uh, kind of uh, minor uh, modest con uh, conclusion. Okay. So uh, Black uh, Lives Matter uh, movement. Uh, again, uh, social media play a significant role, uh, not mass media, I, must, I would say, uh, in making uh, this kind of connective citizen. So it's globally awakened many people uh, to a sense of a necessity to take action together against social injustice and change the world. Uh, so it's uh, Japan too, as well, which I will return uh, shortly. And so uh, there are many uh, uh, observations about this. So social distancing reduce actual social distance. Of course, social distance, its original meaning is uh, quite different. It's a social distance among uh, various groups, uh, ethnicity, uh, ethnic groups, or, 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 or uh, intersectional differences, etc. So apparently such kind of distance is reduced because Black Lives Matter movement is also very inter intersectionalism movement as well. And also, uh, globalized uh, diet straits uh, make people more em empathic. empathic. Uh, we are not quite sure. And also, actually, altruism on the lies. Uh, we are, uh, it is something we are observing. I'm not quite sure. Uh, but uh, some uh, uh, researchers uh, try to uh, give a reason to the rise of a Black Lives Matter movement in many parts of the world. So why is it psychological? Uh, other, uh, the other one is a uh, uh, dynamic grind, uh, slowing down, uh, make people quite softened uh, and more emphatic. And also, uh, and even others are referring to the uh, Hannah Arendt uh, uh, notion of uh, solidarity and the solitude. Uh, so, uh, so to make sense of the BLM movement. So let me just uh, uh, refer to some uh, of their uh, uh, argument. First one is uh, uh, about psychology. So it's a kind of uh, the Pam Ramsden. Uh, so she said uh, yeah, it's a kind of defense mechanism. Uh, so uh, I highlighted some, some important, I think, remark made by her. Uh, people want to believe that they can contribute to some purpose that goes beyond the pandemic. The protests appear to provide people with a sense that life is meaningful, that they can bring about change together. So this kind of uh, you know, uh, psychological defense mechanism going on under this crisis, according to Pam uh, Ramsden. And so, uh, so uh, yeah, maybe I think this might be true. 
and also Naomi Klein, uh, again in her interview uh, uh, with a guardi uh, guardian, uh, sorry, uh, this is uh, a mistake, uh, interview on, in July. So she also said uh, there's something going on. Uh, so she thinks that the being forced to think in more interconnected ways uh, may have softened more of us up to think about the racist uh, atrocities and not to say they are somebody else issue. So this is something going on, uh, something altruism or some kind of new kind of uh, cosmopolitan interconnectedness uh, is going on uh, according uh, to her observation. And uh, I kind of agree uh, with her as well. And others, as I said, uh, refer to the Hannah Arendt uh, notion of uh, uh, loneliness, isolation, and the solitude. And so, uh, so Kate, uh, Kate Brackett, uh, emerged just uh, after the start of the, this kind of crisis, uh, pandemic. Uh, she uh, uh, urged us to, uh, uh, to transform this moment of loneliness into a solitude. So social distancing provides a perfect opportunity to regain this lost art. And so solitude is more necessary than never at this moment, both for uh, weathering the uh, coronavirus and also for restoring the world. So uh, yes, uh, just after the start of a pandemic, uh, she uh, grabbed the, uh, revisit the uh, unarranged uh, notion of uh, solitude uh, to urge us to uh, develop such kind of uh, uh, solitude. And so yes, uh, so a bit later, so as Marsha Gessen in New York, uh, the New Yorker, uh, not quite optimistic, a little bit pessimistic. Uh, but uh, uh, in June, uh, Barbara Taylor uh, was, became more optimistic by uh, looking at the rise of BLM movement, actually. And so uh, she said in this, uh, uh, she's, uh, uh, watching the kind of seed of uh, our empowerment and the global solidarity uh, on the rise. Uh, this is a moment of us uh, people become, uh, you use their own time to become more solitude and also have a uh, develop a kind of critical thinking and of a critical way of a sense of uh, uh, solidarity, uh, working together with other people, uh, not on the street. Uh, so uh, I think this kind of, uh, of course, there is no one uh, reason, of course, uh, we can give to the rise of uh, uh, BLM movement in many parts of the world. So each location has a different kind of a cause and effect, of course. And we need to be, of course, more carefully analyze and uh, consider the cases. But uh, I think uh, at the moment, at this moment, I think it's quite uh, uh, enough for us to understand the, uh, the rise of uh, this kind of movement. But in Japan, uh, yes, uh, Japan too, but uh, whenever we look at the Japanese media, uh, so this picture is not quite uh, you know, optimistic because Japanese mass media still reproduce stereotype. As you see, this is uh, images made by Japanese mass media in HK, uh, which pro a program the special issue special program about the BLM in the US. And also in Japan, uh, uh, not uh, to death, but a similar kind of incident uh, is occurring in Japan as well. So this is a kind of Kurdish person uh, arrested uh, without any substantial reason by police and the kind of uh, police violence, as you see, are going on. And so this also happened in May, uh, but uh, not many mass media in Japan report on this. Only, as far as I know, only just minus Shimbu newspaper reported and uh, showed up this kind of uh, 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 video clips as well. And also, that, but uh, this uh, laser coincided with the BLM and the BLM movement in Japan. And uh, this is a, a kind of a, a demonstration against BLM and against the uh, uh, racism in Japan. So uh, this uh, BLM, not just BLM, and um, this kind of incident, uh, uh, as people, okay, younger people, 
in Japan to consider racism not just their American problem, but it is our problem as well in Japan. So uh, here are some pictures, uh, uh, BLM um, uh, demonstration in Japan, in Tokyo and in Osaka. And so uh, it's quite not rare uh, in Japan for this kind of protest, uh, big protest uh, to happen. But uh, this includes not just uh, activists who are racial ethnic minorities, but also many wide range of people, uh, including uh, this kind of very uh, so-called ordinary, if you like, people who are not uh, involved in this kind of racist uh, movement. Or, or, uh, and also, uh, of course, this is, as I said, intersectionalist movement. So this kind of LGBT people also uh, join uh, this movement. Um, so uh, this is, uh, again, uh, as I show, this kind of uh, anti-racism uh, police violence against uh, uh, ethnic minority in Japan. So uh, these people also join uh, that this kind of BLM movement as well. So this is something happening. And also even mass media uh, also show, uh, show a very progressive uh, kind of uh, posture. Uh, this is another uh, program by NHK, it's a same public uh, broadcasting company in Japan. It's called the Barrier Free Variety Show uh, in NHK. So in July, uh, they have a special issue, a program about BLM and Japan. It's a, it's a kind of self-critique about what uh, NHK, uh, as a program of NHK, showed about the, uh, trying to understand the BLM movement as American issue, not our issue. So it is quite interesting and uh, showing a systemic racism or microaggression in this program to explain about uh, this issue in detail. And also, uh, as you know, Naomi Osaka, who won the US Open uh, this week, and uh, she showed, of course, this uh, seven uh, black masks. Uh, and also Japanese newspaper, uh, this is a Tokyo newspaper, Tokyo Shinbun, uh, feature these uh, issues, not just uh, her uh, win, but also this mask issue in the first page cover. Uh, over the, in the election of a new, would be new prime minister in Japan. Uh, so, this is quite interesting move. And also this is a Asahi Shimbun, Asahi newspaper for kids. Uh, so mostly for primary school kids uh, newspaper. This also features uh, uh, Naomi's uh, mask, not just uh, about her wind. And to uh, ask, uh, to, uh, very, uh, in the very intelligible uh, words, uh, this newspaper article explain about the significance of this masking and also uh, as a uh, student to be more uh, uh, kind of attentive to the diversity uh, existing in Japan and also diversity about yourself as well. So uh, this is, I think, a very uh, interesting, uh, promising uh, movement is uh, on the rise in Japan as well. So uh, to uh, try to understand what they are, uh, people are saying, so so as I said, wide variety of people and the intersectionality media. And also uh, many pe younger people said uh, they are kind of aware of, uh, they don't know anything about racism or BLM and the US and Japan. And also they are very willing to know more about it. And also they are willing to keep on engaging with the issue. And also they hope they will make Japan and the world uh, a more inclusive and egalitarian. So this is a very, I think, promising word uh, expressed by the uh, participants of the, this kind of movement and the new kind of uh, issue. So this is something I think reminded me of uh, this a very important book, How to Be Anti-Racist. Uh, because the opposite of racism not, is not racist. Uh, so anti-racist, uh, both uh, active stance of anti-racist is necessary to combat the racist movement in, in all over the world. I think at least some people in Japan and in the many parts of the world are realizing this kind of important. So uh, I, I, I conclude by showing, uh, I think, yes, gloomy future scenario is with us. And uh, yes, I think this will have a very strong power. Uh, so how we combat uh, this, again, this kind of scenario is uh, not an easy task for us. And uh, 
but at least uh, as a uh, teacher and the uh, researcher of the university, uh, I would like to consider uh, taking more seriously the question of how to advance the seed of our empowerment, empowerment and global solidarity we are observing uh, infinitely uh, in many parts of the world. And so Naomi Klein said, uh, yes, this time we need to have a clear vision and action plan uh, beyond the criticism and protest movement. So to make this kind of shift to be advanced, yes, I agree. So I think in this sense, this conference is great because not just humanities and also many STEM uh, scholars also join together. So I think humanities role in coordinating the creation of a huge future vision uh, with uh, STEM uh, scholars and also particularly I have concern with the digital technology, how to use, how to make use it. And so, uh, and also, well, we also need to make a critical, I think, public pedagogy uh, to let people know uh, not uh, about how to uh, have a, uh, this kind of future plan, why it is important. And also, I think this kind of public pedagogy also need to uh, explain why solidarity is uh, necessary, significant, and also uh, the solidarity is uh, to be considered as a destiny. So let me finish. Uh, by referring to the Bauman's uh, very important uh, notion about uh, uh, his distinction between uh, 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 solidarity and uh, tolerance for diversity and the distinction between destiny and uh, fate. The first quote is explained why solidarity is necessary, uh, not just a tolerance for diversity. So it's a kind of very strong term, but I'm quite in, I love this uh, joining the battle of the safe for the other difference. It is the uh, uh, indispensable for the survival in the world of a contingency diversity. Because his argument is, of course, in the age of postmodernity. But uh, let me, uh, I think we should, uh, we could uh, appropriate his uh, notion of uh, this kind of uh, diversity. And also, uh, second one, diversity as a destiny. Uh, because it needs to be made responsibly by the act of a choice and the will to remain loyal to the, uh, the choice made. I think uh, this kind of uh, both uh, why solidarity is necessary and also how to uh, nurture the kind of a, uh, sense of a solidarity as destiny. Uh, I think this is something uh, we should take uh, seriously under this moment. Uh, and also uh, as a researcher and a teacher of the university, I think, uh, we should get together to consider and advance this kind of uh, uh, future vision and also uh, critical uh, pedagogical uh, uh, plans uh, towards the future. Thank you very much. Thank you, Koichi. That was a fascinating presentation and very, very much appreciated. Thanks a, a great deal. Thank you. Well, my approach uh, is uh, going to be somewhat different. Uh, I'm not, I don't have a PowerPoint. But I do have a, a, a very well prepared argument. And I wanted to start by uh, discussing my relationship to the university of which I've been a part for nearly 25 years. So I'm going to uh, dive into this and uh, I'll set my timer. From the beginning of 200, 2007 until the summer of 2017, I was involved in the development, design, and construction of a new campus for Emily Carr University of Art and Design in Vancouver. I'm starting this way in order to present the idea that uh, I had, an, I, I had a, a goal in mind, an ideal that I wanted to achieve, and it was centered on re rebuilding, rethinking, and uh, redesigning the pedagogy of a small educational institution. The 10 years that it took taught me a great deal about the many different ways in which communities work, define themselves, and imagine their own futures. This short presentation will look at the process of design and the development of a model that reflected the perceived needs of the community for which the campus was built. This then will be the basis for examining a post-COVID strategy devoted to learning, reconciliation, and engagement in education. In the early stages of the campus project, a small group of planners from Emily Carr and some external consultants became ethnographers, seeking to understand the complexity and diversity of expectations among members of the university community for a project of this scope and size. The goal was to involve the community in a broad-based consultation that would then be reflected in the design of the new campus that we wanted to build. During one phase, over a period of 24 months, 
268 meetings were held, which included faculty, students, staff, alumni, administration. I want to emphasize that. There were so many meetings that we were uh, basically in a state of exhaustion uh, every, uh, every day and weekends were very precious. But the idea behind having 268 meetings was to actually really get a deep sense of the community's point of view at that point in time. The architects also participated. At another point, in order to better understand the existing campus, another 80 or so meetings were held. This information gathering period informed the specifications and design of the future campus. Both series of meetings were an opportunity for people to get to know each other and witness and participate in creative and discursive engagements around new ideas for the built environment in learning and education. And as you'll see later on, this has a, a very strong applicability to the future of, uh, of more informed and radical pedagogy within, the, within education as a whole. There were eight principles which emerged from this process of engagement. And I'll mention in detail two of them. And this says something about the state that we're in at the moment and how we can actually resolve it. Students at the center was a very important principle that we agreed on as a community, as a totality with an emphasis on diversity, inclusion, reconciliation, and pedagogical innovation. To make this a visible goal, we decided that the core of the new campus would have an Aboriginal gathering place at the heart of the main floor from which other areas would radiate. We created a two-level library and learning commons across the hall from the gathering place in order to encourage those two areas to speak to each other about knowledge, exchange, and community. So that principle was, come, was a, a product of a a lot of discussion and a lot of in, uh, involvement on the part of all, of, uh, all the people who worked at Emily Carr and all the students who were attending at the time. I keep emphasizing this is a cutout in time, pre-COVID, and I'll come back to that in a moment. Bringing the public in uh, was another principle with Emily Carr values at the core, which was about being inviting and accessible and breaking down barriers between the university and its communities. This principle was developed to acknowledge and promote respect for diversity of cultures and indigenous practices, creativity and experimentation, support for lifelong learning, and social and environmental sustainability and responsibility. So those two principles were uh, very, very important to the community and defined in large measure a strategy that would uh, then be hopefully incorporated into the architecture of the building itself. Remember, these were just two of the eight principles, and yet they revealed a great deal about intent, design, and desired outcomes on the part of the community, with a focus on pedagogy and innovation. These principles were not developed in a vacuum. They were tied to a process of consultation which went far beyond the conventional approaches used to survey members of a, of a community or hold public meetings for the projects of this nature and scope. And there were six other principles, which I'll just list because time is short. The third principle was closer to home. So the university now is moving to a space that was much closer to where students lived and much closer to the areas that uh, faculty also inhabited. Making and remaking, which is a principle that is very important to the artistic world. 21st century infrastructure and advanced infrastructure, which I'll discuss in a, in a moment. Access and diversity, increasing our access and increasing the diversification of our programs and relationship with community visibility and transparency, both within and without. The uh, entire campus is built with many, many windows on the exterior so you can see things that are going on inside. And creative work everywhere, uh, a really important philosophical goal that everyone should have access to the building and to the campus and be involved in creative activities and that that work should take place as much in the community as it should take place within the campus itself. So I consider these principles to be a reflection of the state of mind of the university community at a point in time when conventional divisions and disagreements were slightly less weighty and there was a convergence of concerns, interests and goals among a diverse and deeply committed group of institutional members, including students. Suffice it to say, the process of discussion was often rocky and challenging. There were worries the community's needs would not be fulfilled. There were financial challenges and fundraising was difficult. The budget for the new campus was cut by 20% when the government decided to take a look and reevaluate all its capital investments. There's much more, but rather than focus on these challenges, I want to mention how solid the community remained throughout this period. There was the sense and appreciation of the fact that this was a once in a lifetime opportunity. There was a strong desire to use this opportunity to find out as much as possible about what disciplines shared as opposed to what differentiated them 
what students, faculty, and staff shared, and how our diverse communities, both inside and outside the school, could inform decision making. This was taken very, very seriously by the entire group. There was excitement about reinventing the look, feel, and functionality of studios, labs, and classrooms. There was interest and support for a welcoming theater and main gallery that would reflect the values of the university. Most of all, community members were looking for in intimacy and openness, both with each other and with the public in the design and uh, uh, output of the building itself. Questions arose about the nature, intention, and effect of art schools. There were discussions about the built environment, flexibility, and putting in many internal windows to encourage visibility and transparency among disciplines. I mentioned these characteristics because at this particular point in time, they reflected the outlook and philosophy of that community. There was another level to this relative, relatively utopian and, and hopeful outlook. It was the strong desire for the disciplines to change, to connect with greater depth to each other, to rid the university of the silos that had been built up, and importantly, to create a space where new disciplines could be invented and then developed. There was a genuine desire to reinvent ourselves. For those of us who've been in universities for decades, this was an exciting development with the potential for renewal. At one point, I suggested there would be four floors completely open without walls that would allow for the disciplines to mix and students from different areas to learn from each other and from the work they were pursuing. Needless to say, that didn't happen. And I'll stop for a moment and say that uh, these ideals, which uh, are so important uh, from my point of view to any reinvigoration of pedagogical innovation at the university level, these ideals are something that actually sit in the sort of latent state within the community waiting to be activated. And uh, recent events around COVID and Black Lives Matters and, and uh, many other debates of this nature, many other events have really brought to the fore the need and necessity for examining exactly how we learn and why we learn and what kind of pedagogy we're using. Institutions, I believe, have a set of characteristics and modes of teaching and learning that are reproduced from generation to generation. Change happens slowly. Emily Carr was built as a studio school in the 19th century tradition with an emphasis on craft and hands-on learning. It evolved from a college to an institute to a university. In all cases, in all instances, studio practices remained at the heart of the school's pedagogy and creativity. In terms of context and location, it has continuously sustained cultural activity on the west coast of Canada. It has been a hub of cultural innovation in Canada as a whole. The new campus was designed to celebrate those achievements and bring history to bear in charting a path to a new future while retaining some of its most important traditions. So the campus opened in August 2017, and I won't talk about the years of work that went into opening at that point, following a monumental job of packing and moving an entire institution from its previous location. When the building opened, staff, faculty, and students walked around in a daze, overwhelmed by the light, the grandeur of the building, the sense of renewal. There were, of course, many challenges and deficiencies that needed to be overcome. But for the most part, these issues were met with vigor and joy and a solution-driven attitude. So this brief introduction to a shared achievement highlights how community members are defined by their heterogeneity and contingency, and that it is possible, it should always be possible to find common ground. After a few months in the new campus, however, many faults in the design, layout, and functionality were found. Within a short space of a year, all the conflicting visions for the school came into the foreground and unity frayed. The meetings we held were, were the meetings, the many meetings we held were forgotten. And I can say that as a consequence of that forgetting, a great deal changed as well within the institution in terms of goals and direction. Over time, conventional and some unsuspected errors in the con construction contributed to differences of opinion and challenges about the use of space, who was prioritized and who felt marginalized. Some issues were minor, others were major. Openness, a value agreed upon by the community prior to construction, quickly changed and divisions reappeared. Curtains and other coverings were draped across internal windows. Open studio spaces were rebuilt to divide into small private spaces. Broad hallways were narrowed. Shared faculty office were dis offices were disparaged. Open spaces were enclosed. So what does this say? Uh, and this is where it becomes really relevant to our discussion today. What does it say about our consultation process? With all those meetings, what did we actually achieve? Well, it reveals something very important. In the early phase, we'd captured a moment in time, a community at one particular instant in its history. However, the very term community suggests continual evolution, change, and adaptation. 
communications within communities quickly change and sometimes dramatically as new priorities and plans. This inherent instability is what keeps communities and crucially communications within and among communities actually working. But we had been unable to account for this in the planning. Fluidity, instability, fuzziness are not terms governments or construction companies understand. And as we've recently discovered, most policymakers don't understand either. Architects are very aware of these elements, but few buildings are by their very nature insecure, unsure, or hesitant about their purpose. They are built for stability, durability, and longevity, not for the contingencies that arrive with habitation. And the same can be said even for existing uh, campuses and existing educational institutions. They're built for stability and durability and, and longevity, and they outlive the generations of students and faculties that uh, become part of their communities for a short period of time. Um, but universities are dynamic, and the arrival of new generations of students every September intensifies the instability, which is not, a, not ca uh, qualifying that as a negative. These are not negative characteristics, but they increase the burden on faculty and staff and demand adaptability and flexibility when that may not be possible all the time. Most importantly, they throw into relief how challenging it is to change the core values of institutions, even those more conscious of their history and impact. Now introduce COVID-19 to this evolving complexity of community building. And without a chance to discuss transitional processes, the very foundations of university education were thrown into question. For example, we moved very quickly from the exploration of the potential of a new campus to questioning its usefulness. And in questioning uh, that, we also questioned the very importance and centrality of the built environment. COVID-19 has made it almost impossible to accept the fact that the built environment may not be the solution to what we actually are seeking in education. So I would disagree with Dean a little bit about uh, the change here, the, the flexibility and uh, fluidity of what uh, online education provides may in fact upset the built environment and get rid of the solidity that I'm talking about. Universities benefit from the fact that new generations of students arrive and then spend four years learning as much about the culture of the institution as they do about its purpose. They are agents of acculturation and become acculturated as well. Rightfully, they demand accountability and clarity. They want facilities and technologies to be up to date. They expect the learning and teaching process to be of the highest quality. They anticipate friendship, conflict, camaraderie, and engagement. The new campus has been built to meet these expectations, but not in a context where students cannot attend and where the organization of space has been, had been contested so quickly. And when COVID-19 arrived, learning and teaching were necessarily recontextualized and compressed into and onto video screens. We're learning a great deal about the limitations and potential of two-dimensional worlds. So I've been exploring how complex the normal communications process is. Now transpose this to screen-based worlds or image worlds and the challenges increase exponentially. The context for learning has shifted from the built environment to a fluid and increasingly complex hybrid, hybrid of multiple spaces, places, and times. The implications of this for the future of interaction education are huge. It is possible though that the online world, which is the one generation Z knows best, will become the basis for the learning and not just be the add-on. At the same time, we will have to recast what we mean by interpersonal interaction and recognize what the ground rule, how the ground rules have changed. The new campus was built to encourage informal learning, which I hope will now be more fully recognized for its ubiquity and importance. That should engender an appreciation of the flexible time sequences that meld the formal and the informal into learning constellations. Schedules for learning will have to accommodate the fluidity of the informal. The new campus was not built for remote learning, neither were our houses, but we're after going to have to change all of that. Informal learning cannot be fit into a schedule and hopefully the school day will now be recognized as more of a collection of classes, now be recognized as more than a collection of classes. In fact, the entire issue of time management needs revision and reinvention uh, in the university area. We've been offered an amazing opportunity to re-envisage when and where learning takes place. At the same time, a chat room is not like a lounge or a cafeteria. There's less chance for serendipity and accidental encounters and discussions. The notion of the agora is difficult to reproduce on screen. The online world is driven by exchanges of information with an emphasis on lecturing and cannot match the complexity of in-person encounters governed by as many unconscious as conscious human cues and signals. The post-COVID university will have to grapple with some of these concerns and look for new interactive notions of presence, irrespective of place. Our very ideas about space will necessarily change and have already. 
So I've been really thinking a lot about voice and how challenging it is to listen online. And you've been listening to me droning on here, so I'm a good example of that. Voice is also about difference and diversity, about hearing the unexpected and cluing into subtleties of expression, both linguistic and nonverbal. The online world cannot match or duplicate interpersonal encounters of the sort I'm discussing. So we will be able to retain some of the, so will we be able to retain some of the experimental aspects of in-person learning? In general, how experimental can we be and how experimental will we become? Will assessment change and will we be looking for different uh, qualities and outcomes from media-based interactions balanced by in-person encounters? Will customization be the norm? And how will that be accomplished? Will customization be the demand? And where will the resources come from to achieve that outcome? Most of all, what kind of communities are we now focused on establishing? Students have always learned a great deal from each other. How can that be encouraged online? How does assessment fit into all of this? What values will be attached to credentials? What are the differences between online credits and in-person credits? Do these distinctions in fact even matter? As I mentioned before, communities are both fragile and resilient. Their flexibility is their strength, but they depend on continual engagement, interaction, some degree of predictability, the sense that people know what is going on and why, transparency and accountability, and the feeling constituents will be heard. Learning is not only about consumption, it is also about contestation. And to what degree something and to what degree is something prepackaged for online uh, consumption available to be contested? Can it be contested? Ultimately, questions about community are also questions about the social self, language, and meaning. Any collectivity is shaped by the implicit and the explicit, by distinctiveness and sharing, and by the convergence of individual needs with community expectations. The challenge will be how to navigate these levels of complexity while engaging with diverse outlooks and personal and shared histories. We've entered a period when the continued aspects of human interaction will help define the relational map of institutional engagement. And, que and when questions of when to learn will be replaced by learning as part of a continuum, neither defined by the built environment nor completely outside of it. Autonomy will become more of a value as long as it's attached to commitment and experimentation. The classroom will have no walls at last. So uh, when I say the classroom will have no walls and I'll finish with this, uh, I'm actually, uh, both saddened and happy about it. Uh, constraint and uh, the built environment helps define community, but often the built environment as we've discovered among many of the universities of which I've been a part, and certainly I'm sure many of you have been a part, the built environment also defines a procedure and a process and a series of policies and a way of living and a way of teaching and a way of learning uh, that needs disruption. So I'm going to take the optimistic side of COVID and say it may help us finally disrupt what we've actually taken for granted. Thank you. Okay, so since I'm the convener, uh, I, uh, I have to sort of start the discussion on the panel, but I think maybe the best thing to do would be, given that my presentation was last, are there any comments that you'd like to make on what I just said? So we can start with that and come back to the other presentations after that. Rod. Well, uh, I, I just said that even though we haven't um, communicated much or collaborated in advance, um, I think that I'm entirely in sympathy, uh, having reached it via a different route, but what you've been saying about the construction of a learning environment in Emily Carr. And to keep it brief, I just say there was a conference on uh, the digital future at Trinity College in Dublin a couple of years ago, and I gave a paper called The Return to the Analog. Now, obviously, I'm not suggesting that the digital world will be abandoned. As long as the electricity supply continues, there are many and wonderful facilities through the digital. And if I manage to show a couple of them with uh, Van Eyck and Steel Antico, they can stand for the possibilities of the digital. And Dina is a whole other dimension. However, nothing, it seems to me, that happens in the digital world can do other than supplement 
the aura, the presence, the complexity of interaction on analog means. So in fact, the digital world enhances the importance of the buildings that you have made and the way that people move uh, through that space, I would have said. So I think, um, I think we agree by a, a, a different uh, route. Yeah. Thank you, Rod. I, I would agree with you. Koichi, do you have any comments? Uh, no, uh, uh, yeah, uh, I'm quite interested yeah, in such kind of uh, uh, pedagogy development and the community involvement. That's great. So, yes, so I, I don't know. Uh, after this crisis, how would you like to develop your project further? So, is there any idea? The project of the campus itself? Yeah. Uh, I think the, uh, the, the canvas is built and it's now uh, three years old and it's already quite crusty to me. I'm interested in experimentation. Uh, I, I really appreciated what Dina did. Her, her presentation highlighted that uh, dimension. I'm interested in how groups get together spontaneously and deliberately. Mm -hmm. I'm interested in, in the, the question of longevity, longevity and stability uh, uh, set against the questions of instability and uh, you know, the uh, unstable world that we live in. Um, <clears throat> so I, I've moved on from that campus uh, quite a bit. But what I've, not what I've noted in, in most universities is a desperate attempt to return to the past and not a recognition that we actually are on the cusp of a revolution pedagogically that may in fact change everything. The reason I say that is because I'm pretty sure that the generation of students growing up in this particular world we now inhabit will never accept anything but uh, genuine community as an experience. I, and I th I, that came out for me in the demonstrations around Black Lives Matter, it came out uh, in the kind of universality of those discussions across cultures and the way in which people grabbed hold of the, of the issues and tried to promote their views of them. But Dina, what do you, what do you think? Well, as you're quizzing me, I will say what I think. I wanted to stay silent, actually. Uh, I personally believe to be ahead of the curve, Ron. Okay. Uh, interesting to listen to you and to, and I genuinely wonder what keeps you in this belief, a belief which I used to have, but I lost. Uh, recently, <laughs> hearing, uh, hearing papers uh, uh, after my retirement, kind of moving uh, uh, various archives and so on, I came across papers about uh, the, the progressive move to online education published in 98 and 99 mm -hmm. in the journal Convergence, which was in its first year back then. Uh, I was still in North America at that time. Uh, as a single mother, I had embraced online teaching so that I can take care of my baby at the same time. Uh, then coming to the UK in 1998, uh, uh, I was faced with complete denial about the new realities of the internet. So like um, for years, I had been fighting the frustration of bringing in this kind of uh, uh, new, uh, new approaches to teaching. Uh, uh, several years ago, I proposed a Master of Fine Arts program to my university. Uh, which was supposed to be half delivered online, so very similar to the hybrid models uh, uh, that are uh, now in circulation, but it was like, you know, the time was not right, so it didn't happen. Uh, so kind of like I had been to all this, uh, and uh, I am now coming to a point when I genuinely, uh, of course, it is clear to me that this would be the future, but what I see is I don't want to share stories of precarity. Uh, my recent PhD students have been uh, hired at various universities to conditions which are completely unacceptable and uh, really I must say uh, kind of like you know I am trying to behave optimistically but everything I say uh, I see and like you know the moment I analyze it rationally it doesn't look good at all I'm afraid so I don't know specifically about Emily Kite has great reputation uh, but thinking of similar establishments I know elsewhere uh, I think uh, specifically my biggest concern is uh, people who work for these uh, uh, environments are not treated properly. Actually, I, 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 so couldn't, I wonder I, how you managed to be so, so committed. I couldn't agree more with you actually. Precarity was an obsession of mine 
And, uh, and it became a, a feature of the institution when I was the president uh, to a degree that I never anticipated and never wanted. Uh, but these are in Canada publicly funded institutions and the budget that Emily Carr has uh, is a very small one for the number of students it actually teaches. So it was forced into that. Uh, it's the same in Britain where the universities have been forced into an incredible precarity. Uh, no, but I'm an optimist about learning because I, I work it from the student side. Uh, you know, I find, for example, I'm fascinated by TikTok and by the shared culture that uh, TikTokians uh, share with each other. And I think that they're learning from each other in ways that we are perhaps from our generation less capable of seeing. And what I'd love to see is I'd love to see that learning that they are engaging with become a part of the everyday life of the university, not necessarily through courses, but through the informality of discussion. I've always envisioned, for my, my, my vision has always been openness, uh, resilience, uh, inclusion, uh, getting rid of the barriers. So I see, I'm not, I, I'm optimistic about the, the way in which those worlds are colliding and the possibility that they may actually then re reinvigorate and find a new, new methodology. But I, I could be a total fantasist too. <laughs> Any other comments that we can make? I thought your, your, your uh, presentation was fascinating, Rod. I mean, the, the thing which connects with what you've just said is another area of political discussion which needs to take place digitally, but also in um, analog form, which is about the economy of higher education. And, yes. um, uh, you know, uh, it connects with the precarity, uh, et cetera, et cetera. I mean, there's a lot of ground uh, to, to cover and to change when institutions um, are increasingly, or at least in the West, my experience is institutions are increasingly uh, dominated by um, monetarization and a management that is looking um, at uh, numbers all the time. Uh, I think listening to students in a different way, I mean, they're con constituted as clients at the moment that pay money, but listening to students in a different way. And maybe also thinking about how uh, the scale of higher education and how that works uh, economically as well as pedagogically. Um, uh, like Dina, um, I, I don't like to use the word retire, but um, I'm not in full-time academic work for the last few years. And I think that gives a real perspective on the development of higher education, certainly in the West. Um, and there's a lot to, as my last start, slide suggested, a lot to think again about, really. And uh, your process of consultation seems a very good starting point. And um, uh, uh, I would rather hope that it could be, could take place um, uh, uh, more generally. Yeah, I think that uh, the, uh, for me, the barriers, my, I mean, the best way to put it is my own experience of university was chaotic as a student. And I actually, at the time, was quite angry about the chaos. And now on reflection, as I've aged, I wish it would have been more chaotic. <laughs> uh, it, 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 to some extent, uh, it's the desire to control the process and to, to classify and categorize, to time manage, uh, and to uh, focus on credentials that has actually produced the, uh, a, a very strange outcome uh, for us in our culture as well. So much of what I see as a progressive education is happening in the streets. And I think that's where Koichi's work was actually very interesting. Uh, it's happening in the uh, spontaneity of uh, responses uh, to COVID and the spontaneity of responses to racism. And how can that, that spontaneity be captured within the university environment, nurtured, and given more perhaps disciplinary rigor, more historical oversight, uh, which is what we offer, we offer from a generational point of view, even if we're retired, the capacity and the possibility of historical overview. And that's a, a value that uh, I think is actually shared by the students because they love listening to and discussing and interacting with people who tell them the stories that they don't know. So somewhere in between that kind of messy text that I just constructed, there is something there that I think we can perhaps focus on. But I do see that a question has come up in the question and answer. So let me just go to it. Um, I have a question for all of you. Why do you think we have called it social distancing and not physical distancing? 
I think we are still very much socially involved with each other, but the difference is that we are physically apart and not socially. And think the term social distancing calls for more negative connotations than physical distancing. What do you think? Thank you. That's uh, Ms. Radhika Vang Jen Jen Jensen. Thank you, Radhika, for a great question. Who wants to take that on first? Why are we calling it social distancing and not physical distancing? It's an interesting and subtle distinction. Anybody want to take that on? <laughs> Nina. Uh, I'm just happy to react. Uh, it's a very good point, actually, and uh, yeah. let's switch to physical distancing. But uh, obviously, we are not. Uh, we are just adopting language that has been proposed in the public space. Uh, uh, it also shows how intricately connected social space is linked to the body and to the physical. And this is one thing which I was trying. I hope it came through in my presentation. Uh, that kind of like, you know, if we move to live in the body, if we by become identical with ourselves, the physical becomes much more important than any imaginary social dimension. So I'm all for uh, changing this to physical distancing. Yeah, I totally agree with you. I'm actually very much in favor of changing it as well. And it's, uh, it's not even a point that I thought, thought about, but it's interesting from a government perspective why that was, would have been chosen. I mean, there's a research paper right there fascinating one actually because it's uh, unclear to me why they would have chosen the social as a term any other comments yes rod i i, I think that um to think beyond the uh period of the virus um i remember um discussion in the early period of semiotics about uh, a new micro uh, discipline called proxemics which was precisely about how close people should be to one another and the image of an Italian person um, having a discussion with a Swedish person and basically chasing them around the table because the Italian wanted to get closer and the Scandinavian wanted more space and I would say if remembering me too if the relations of power can be uh, thought through and uh, distortions removed, I think intimacy and physical closeness is to be supported. It's uh, 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 exactly part of what, what I was trying to say about the preference for the analog. I couldn't agree more. This uh, is after the virus. I mean, at the moment, um, <laughs> we need a bit of space and to wear masks, etc. But I do think we we're being offered a, an opportunity, if not a platform, to rethink what we mean by the proximal and, and the distal. And we've tended in our, I, I learned a lot of building that new campus about art, the architecture of classrooms. I mean, this, these are 19th century inventions classrooms. And they were the most efficient way of actually uh, surveilling the students who were attending them. They were not built from a pedagogical perspective, especially the way the desks are lined up and the way the seats are placed and so on. And I know a lot of universities have moved to round tables and, but they still have this notion of the class and the classroom. And it built into the room is of course the class. We won't get that, go, go in <laughs> that direction today, but there's something about that that says a great deal about the assumptions that we've taken for granted. I remember seeing a film school in, in Hamburg, which had a room called the Ideas Room with no furniture in it, just a lot of soft bean bags. No paper and no laptops could be brought into it. <laughs> so that the group had a space where discussion and debate um, took place in a soft center without note taking or reference or phones or laptops or anything. Yeah, and the Willem de Koenig Art School in uh, Rotterdam has actually dissolved its entire time management system and changed its entire approach to uh, teaching and learning. It's quite a radical uh, shift uh, at that, uh, that institution. So there are models out there for that change. And there's some other schools in Britain that have attempted that as well. Well, I think John and Meta, I think we've exhausted our uh, questions and answers here at this point. There are no more questions on the Q&A. Unless, uh, hold on. There's a chat thing that came up here. Is it for Dina? Did you see the chat? Yeah, Dina, Dina uh, did you yes, see the I question? Just, 
uh, uh, I didn't meet the farmers, uh, but I met other people locally. Uh, I spoke more to people down the street because it's a village, but of course it's also a Bedouin community. Uh, so it's more often to meet uh, somebody who tells me they live in Grail, but I've never met them here. We are somewhere in Edinburgh or in St. Andrews or something like this, and then we identify each other locally. So uh, I did take steps to meet local people, and uh, I took many other steps, like to shop less in supermarkets, but uh, instead shop locally. Uh, and a long list of other things. Uh, and actually, uh, these little steps uh, result in a big change. So thank you, Mette, for the question. There is another question online. I, she, uh, Radhika just wanted to say thank you for the answers that we provided. All right, I think we're, we're done, uh, John, Meta. I got, can I turn it over to you to finish, or do you, or do you, you want me to finish? No. There's an echo. No, I, I, I personally really enjoyed uh, the variety, really, uh, of your approaches. Uh, but even though you're different, uh, there's a lot of convergences, um, and I take a lot of uh, you know encouragement uh, from you in terms of moving forward with the kind of, yes, uh, is, a, is a kind of uncertain hope, but hope nonetheless, uh, with respect to education, with respect to our social life, with respect to empowerment and change uh, and all that. Uh, some of your materials is so poignant to me. So I think this is a, a wonderful, wonderful, uh, wonderful session. I don't thank want to add anything, yeah. I just want to thank you all. It was an absolute delight to be in your presence today. And I wish we could have been a lot closer, obviously, but, right. but I did feel connected and I did. I was very touched and very moved by, by your intervention. So really a big thank you to all of you. Um, thanks. Okay, thank, thank you, you very much, Meta. And thank you, John, for the hard thank work. You. Everybody, Everybody stay, stay well and healthy. healthy. Yeah. yeah, you too. Until next time. Bye-bye. Ciao. Thank you.